Thank you, and good afternoon, everybody. So just for the first slide overview, so we have kind of four parts, kind of the first two um, general parts, more a little bit, and then there will be a technical architecture part, and in the uh, end, a demonstration about what we can do at the moment and how you can use our tools and stuff like that. So we will talk about the InfoList project, and this is a joint project with the Gases, Jesus, Leibniz Institute for the Social Sciences and with the University of Mannheim, or respectively the Hochschule der Medien Stuttgart, so that's one. And um, we, as the Mannheim University Library UB in Mannheim. It's funded by the DFG, the German Research uh, Foundation, and we are now in the second funding phase. Funding phase. So just that we are on the same level, maybe, let's start with some easy stuff, research data. Well, that's just some raw data. Imagine some numbers you have measured, you have made some experiments, and you're measuring that. And that will be kind of an, maybe an intermediate step in your research process. Um, and you're then heading for the publication where you do some nice analysis. So this would be the first possibility, but you can also kind of take research data from a data provider or from some offici official statistics, like for countries there are a lot of uh, data available, or also for um, other um, organization or stuff like that. Or you can just take the research data from your colleague, given that he or she shares it with you, or maybe has even published it. So if you're using some um, other work, other um, scholarly works, well, then you have to cite it. And the citation is just some formal, structured reference to another scholarly work. Data citation is then kind of the thing if the scholarly work is research data. So let's start maybe when does this data citation actually start it. I have here a timeline. Uh, I think we have seen at least some of the dates, so more or less uh, already. And the uh, first question I would, would like to ask, when was the first structured data citation used in a publication? So I claim maybe around the year 2000. If you have any proof or more hints, uh, just send it to us. We are interested kind of to find out maybe a more accurate date. Next question, well, when was the first unstructured reference to research data used in a publication? And here we say, well, that's 1609 or before. And the proof just follows. Here is one of the first unstructured data citations. It's a paper, or a book actually, by Kepler, so he's the author. And the title, well, actually the whole stuff here above, that's the title. If you translate it into uh, English, it says, New Astronomy Based Upon Causes or Celestial Physics Treated by Means of Commentaries on the Motions of the Star Mars from the Observations of Tycho Brahe. So we see here he mentions this observation, this research data from Tycho Brahe. So he cites that. He does some data citation, kind of. How does he do that? Well, just by, well, a little bit above, should it be, from the observation of Tycho Brahe. So that's just the sentences here, part of the title, which um, is the uh, suggestion that he's, uh, or the data citation, kind of. Well, that was uh, a long time ago, and actually now we have some data citation principles. So these are the eight data citation principles. Um, first one is, well, it's just important. It's actually as important as other citations, so you should do kind of the same thing as you're doing for the other citations. And you should make it um, easy or facilitates to give credit and attribution to the authors or to the contributors of this research data. You should evidence, so you should do data citations whenever you're using some research data, you should um, cite them also as a citation. U a unique identification, some global identifier, for example, um, access, how can you access the research data, persistence, and two more. Currently, there are 100, ex actually exactly 100 institutional supporters. This means if your institution wants to become the 101st, you have maybe to hurry up a little bit. There are some data centers, publishers, and societies. Also some library societies are around, among them. 
and some other um, supporters. Well, that was the principle, kind of. How is kind of in the practice, how does a data citation look? Well, here is one format suggested by DataCite. It's just kind of a format you can use. You start with the creator, then the publication year in parentheses, column, title, point, version, point, publisher, point, resource type, point, identify. So not something fancy in there. There's an example. You can maybe move around a little bit and uh, another order, publication year maybe in the end, or some other rules about the separation, stuff like that. So that's the normal thing what citation styles actually are um, forcing you to do. And actually there are also some other well-known citation styles like API who already um, has a data citation guidelines included. Some other examples I have here also from the NLM or the Chicago Manual have at least for databases they are talking about. And journal, some journal styles as well are listed here. But actually in practice the people they are still doing the same thing as 400 years ago. Namely, they are citing or references the research data in the text just by mentioning some words. So, for example, the first one is the caption of a table, and somewhere there's a, the reference to the research data. Second one is, well, it just mentioned the igloo study. And if you read a little bit around, you see there should be some connection to reading literacy. Maybe not the first thing with when you think you come to mind, mind if you see igloo. And this uh, third example, also it can be scattered around uh, in the text as here with the, where the years are not in the same place and some other words in between maybe. So how do you process this, how you can find now the research data, what would be the steps you need? Well, there are different steps you have to perform now. Actually, the first one we have just done, namely the detection of data citation in the running full text. Second one is, well, you have to resolve and normalize kind of the data citations. So for example, the IGLU that stands for the German Internationale Grundschule Leseuntersuchung. Okay, and the, this SERP, that's kind of the abbreviation for the Socioeconomic Panel or also in German, the Socioeconomische Panel and you can even write that differently. So there are different um, possibilities or variants here. Next thing is the unique identified data citations. Actually, uh, there was an IGLU study in 2001, there was another one in 2006, and uh, there was one in 2011. Which one was referenced in the paper before? And last step, kind of find actually now really the cited research data, so you actually you're after some URL, or maybe then just the location. And while well, these steps, they are kind of annoying, you don't want to spend a lot of time, and actually you don't, maybe not no time at all, just see it maybe even in the beginning, that would be nice. So the question is here, is it possible that we can, some of these steps, automate? Maybe some tools, some al um, algorithm where can help us here. And that's exactly the goal, or one of the goals, for the InfoList project. Automating these processing steps. So this means, automatically unraveling hidden references in the running text to research data into structured data citations with URIs. And this all should happen in a flexible, long-term, sustainable infrastructure. So here's an uh, overall view um, about the project. So as always, we need some data like the full text, metadata, stuff like that from research data, from publications, and then our algorithms, they can work on that. They are um, relying on, or there are some data mining algorithms and they are using some bootstrapping strategies and some other stuff like there. We will not call, uh, we will not speak much more about the algorithms, but focus on the technical architecture where they are actually in. And um, the technical architecture relies on linked open data and uh, will provide some RESTful APIs. In between, there is kind of some abstract modeling stuff, some structure semantics, which kind of connects also these algorithms and technical architecture. And you can get out things out of it. So there is an integration. We are trying to integrate it in as much as possible. And maybe we see that here better. 
So as the end user, well, you can, for example, search in a discovery system. Then you're receiving some publication according to your research, to your search, and uh, then it would be nice to see on what um, data were, were this publication relying on. Or if you go the other way, if you're searching in a data repository, finding some research data, it would actually be nice to see which publication were built on top of this research data. So we need some um, links, linking stuff in between them. However, the users, they are not only searching in discovery systems and data repository, but they are also searching in other stuff, which I should mention in a minute. First, this, there is also a question here, how actually to best incorporate data connections into library catalogs. And that question comes from Horizon Report 2014 Library Edition. So you search or use a search also somewhere else, namely, for example, in Google Scholar, or they can maybe search on the journal website or wherever. Actually, somewhere in the web they can make a search. And so actually, it's also a good question to ask here, where and how is the integration of data citation for our user, users most useful? So we see here, actually, um, there's a lot of um, stuff, of um, different systems we would like to cover in this integration. And therefore, we need a really flexible infrastructure which uh, allows us to do that. And that's the next what we want to show you. All right, so we've just seen that there are um, various agents involved or possibly involved with, uh, with the results of our, um, of our project. And uh, this is uh, like a 10,000 view, uh, feet view uh, of our architecture. We have an internal API which does all the heavy lifting, does all the text extraction and so on. That's written in Java and um, it, should be, it should be a mostly self-contained service. On the other hand, we have our public API that should be as flexible as possible, should support um, as many um, different serializations and, and data formats as possible and uh, allow a data model to be as complex as needed, but still be really fast. So speed, speed is of the essence for us. Um, and that's why we, we laid down some, some uh, principles when we started designing this, uh, this whole architecture. The main thing should be that the API usability uh, is more important than, than uh, the expressivity of, of uh, all parts of the model. So we want to support it at the, at the right places, but in general, the API should be easy to maintain, easy to consume uh, for, for possible um, well, developers, and it should be possible to understand the data model. So uh, we try to uh, postpone the making, making the data model extremely complicated part uh, to later and start with uh, something simple. Uh, of course, it should be RESTful-ish, uh, so not all the aspects of uh, RESTful architecture are uh, followed closely or orthodoxly, but uh, still it's protocol independent, so we can reproduce every, everything um, on a local client uh, without HTTP. That's uh, really important because it has to be fast, as we said. Um, and we decided to use uh, a JSON store um, versus a triple store because um, it's really fast. It has native uh, ordered lists or arrays which everyone who has developed uh, RDF software um, knows is a real pain with RDF and it has a de deterministic structure again which RDF has not. And that makes it easy to, to use it for uh, closed world validation which is uh, really important for us. So in general we started out uh, with uh, 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 keeping it simple and um, that's also understandable if we look at the main operations in Info InfoList at the moment, um, there's this bootstrapping part where we try to learn uh, from um, a, a simple uh, seed word uh, new patterns to find data set references um, as uh, Philip showed before. And uh, there's multiple levels of recursion involved and um, it's an iterative process and it's really tough on uh, CPU and on uh, RAM. So here speed is much more important than expressivity. As for text extraction, so extracting text from PDF, uh, which we do a lot, and uh, for uh, applying patterns that we found using this bootstrapping process to, um, uh, to text files, again, these must be really fast and there shouldn't be any, any time lost with uh, serialization or 
um, or, or description or, or complicated data structure um, problems. Now for the data set resolution, that's, um, that's the part about uh, if we have some string like um, SOEP, what does that refer to? Um, which databases must we, must we search? How do we rank these, um, these results? How can we automate the intuition that people uh, put into resolving these data set resolutions? And here, uh, the expressivity is much more important than speed because we, we uh, want uh, perfect results. So I, uh, <clears throat> I still think that deep modeling has its merit and that it's important for us. For example, uh, data set granularity, so um, if someone refers to SOEP, does he mean the whole panel, the whole survey every, every year or just a single year or um, that's one aspect. <clears throat> then there are data set, references, data set references which cannot be automatically resolved without context like um, if people write as the results of our study shows then we know we have to know who are those people and uh, what's the context where did we get this from or uh, something like uh, um, page 15 of the derp panel which we don't know what it is because we can't find it anywhere but we still want to find want to uh, state that we uh, found somewhere that someone references something that's called the derp panel um, also for for doing like uh, bibliometric analysis or, or, or uh, graphing the relationships of the entities in our in our data store uh, we also want to have uh, the possibility to model this deeply and also for um, for uh, mining the provenance of the of the things in our data store um, it would be really helpful to to understand it as a as a set of statements instead of the set of documents so the question is how how do we get uh, the best of of both these worlds, of deep modeling and of, uh, of keeping it simple. And um, to show you that, I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly explain uh, our in architecture. So we have an HTTP server, um, which, which uh, handles the API calls, which has a RDF, uh, JSON-LD, um, content negotiating middleware. And we have uh, a MongoDB storage because uh, that's really easy to set up and easy to uh, deploy and um, fast. <coughs> we are using the Mongoose uh, uh, document, um, document uh, mapper to, to make it a bit easier to, to um, work in code. And then we have uh, a, a mapping um, tool uh, that will map between um, the uh, Mongoose schema and, and, and the incoming data. So for once, this handles um, RDF requests, it handles um, uh, requests for our schema, but it also handles um, uh, the RESTful API requests and uh, exposes um, uh, our data model in different, um, in different serializations. And that, that's all um, controlled by something we call the TSEN. And if you are asking yourself what this uh, spidery thing in the middle is with the arrows to everything else, I will explain that now. So uh, TSEN is our um, self-developed format. It's based on, um, well, it's just JSON-LD with a bit of a different syntax, uh, more oriented towards Turtle because that's uh, easier to read and easier to write. And um, in this, we keep all, all the different aspects. We keep the, um, the, the descriptive part, we keep the uh, um, database schema part, and also the presentation part. So. These are the uh, parts that describe um, the RDF uh, semantics of, of our data model. We have a class execution with uh, two properties, lock and algorithm, uh, which are described in the context. So it's, we, we um, happily stole that from JSON-LV. Then we have the database schema part. So there's a collection execution and a property algorithm, and they are, the uh, algorithm might, may be required or should be indexed and so on. And lastly, this is just, just an example. This one uh, shouldn't be dis displayed in the API front end. So um, yeah, we're mixing, we're mixing different levels, but we um, keep them all in one place, which makes it really easy to, uh, to adapt and to, to fix things. So one schema to rule them all, that's our general idea. Um, from this one uh, file, we generate our ontology, we generate our REST API endpoints, and uh, the documentation for them. Uh, we, we generate our database schema and the indexes that make this database fast. And um, 
a data model explorer, which allows us to, to get a better understanding of how this works. And now let's hope that it works. Uh, the joy of live demos. All right, so what we see here are the, um, are the aspects of our data model. I won't dive into uh, that much detail. I uh, just want to say that execution is the most important thing because we are doing um, heavily algorithmic stuff here. Um, but we also have uh, links between entities, for example, and patterns. And if I open one of these, I see that uh, the, the context aspect is always the RDF part, and I can um, just open all the RDF um, descriptions. Right. So, so here, that's that's now we're on the on the RDF level, but we could also uh, check out the database level. And to see, for example, to find out why some uh, some query is really slow, maybe some some field isn't indexed, and um, we can always um, jump into the uh, real RDF description um, of some class. For example, here, a search query described as um, as turtle in this case um, could also be. I find it always helpful to look at it in JSON LD because that's really terse, um, or anything else, or I could even uh, go crazy and look at some visualization. Right, so <clears throat> that's the um, data model part. Let's look at what we can do with that. So uh, I just showed that in the demo work. That's nice. Um, right, so I jump right into it. Um, we have our API. Um, exposed using the Swagger uh, interface. So all the things, REST LD, something, something are generated from that file. We can do all the HTTP uh, uh, verbs that are relevant for REST, GET, POST, and so on. <clears throat> but what I want to show you is our uh, simplified um, API calls uh, to execute something. And what I want to execute is uh, a short version of that um, uh, learning algorithm. I just copy it. And paste it. So, um, just really quickly, what I'm doing here is I'm executing this frequency based bootstrapping algorithm uh, for all the files that were tagged with uh, this particular tag. Um, oops. Uh, and I start with the seed Albus. So, I know that Albus is a data set reference, and I want to find out what he can deduce uh, from just this information and a lot of files. So, let's Try it out. Okay, the thing is posted, and I get a response also in the uh, location header. And uh, now it has started an execution that's running asynchronously on the server. I open that up, and I get again the um, triple view. So uh, I could look at this, but we have a bit of a nicer interface. So we see the algorithm is at 50%. Just have to hit F5 a few times. Um, while it runs, I can just show you these are all the, the uh, well, the, the knobs and turns uh, that you can uh, configure for an algorithm. And let's see if he finished. Yes, he finished. Right. So um, he has generated a lot of patterns. Oops. Uh, all these patterns are, of course, uh, the referenceable um, resources. Uh, it generated a lot of textual references. So these are the things like um, it's open one. Um, and maybe in turtle. Uh, these are the extracted elements of the of the text, so words left of of the uh, thing we found, and so on. And the pattern. <coughs> Let's check out the pattern as well, which are just um, um, fancy, fancy, just a fancy word for regular expression. And everything can be tagged, and that's how we organize our stuff because that proved to be really fast and simple. And um, now that we've learned something, let's apply this to a PDF file. So uh, for that, we've written a small uh, JavaScript um, library, which is really thin. It just does what, what I just showed you. Um, and I will choose a file, choose two files, and um, we'll try to analyze them. And what, it happen what happens now is he uploads those files to our um, store. 
He extracts the text from the PDF files, and now he tries to apply um, patterns, all patterns from a certain, with a certain tag um, that I just created to, um, to those text files. And yeah, there's a, there's a kind of funny bug where it just jumps <laughs> around, but let's, let's watch it um, in the, uh, again, the triple view and jump into the monitor view where it does the same thing, but uh, he has already found a lot of patterns, right, and, and he has found uh, some links. So let's open one of those. Um, we see this is a link, again, these links are dereferenceable and um, the entities uh, from which they link and to which they link, uh, in this case, uh, from a, a publication and to a data set are um, dereferenceable as well. There's just a little uh, thing that they are not turned into links in this interface, but still it should uh, be dereferenceable. Okay, and we see that it has, he has found a reference um, from this publication that's referenced by this entity to something that's called Anomi Albus. Uh, don't really know, but that's the DOI of the thing. So uh, we've, we've gone the full way, um, and uh, yeah. So that's, that's it. Um, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them, get in touch with us. Uh, if you have any data that you want to run through this, um, yeah, and try it out. It's, uh, well, it's kind of not that stable, but, or, or, or rapid, in rapid development, depending on how you look at it. Thank you very much.